Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, in this hematology lecture series, I'm going to be talking about the structure and function of hematopoietic organs. Please don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. Hematopoiesis is the process by which the body produces blood cells and plasma. It's a lifelong process of continuous formation and turnover of blood cells to meet everyday demands, as well as to respond to increased demand due to injury or infections. Hematopoiesis actually begins as early as 19 days of embryonic life. When developing inside a growing fetus, fetal blood cells have three different phases of development, the mesoblastic phase, the hepatic phase, and the medullary phase. So it starts in the yolk sac, which is the mesoblastic phase, then transitions to the liver, which is the hepatic phase, and it transitions to the liver only temporarily before finally establishing definitive hematopoiesis in the bone marrow and thymus, which is the bone marrow is the medullary phase. And we're going to talk about each of these processes in the coming slides here. The first phase of the fetal development of blood cells is called the mesoblastic phase. This begins as early as 19 days after fertilization. It's called mesoblastic because this is the phase where cells are formed outside of the embryo and the mesenchyme of the yolk sac. So the yolk sac is a structure that develops and provides an embryo with nourishment and circulates gases between the mother and the embryo. The yolk sac also produces cells that turn into important structures in addition to blood cells. It also produces what eventually becomes the umbilical cord and reproductive organs. It has a lining of mesoderm or mesoderm, and this is where the fetal blood cell development takes place. We'll talk in detail about hemoglobin um, in upcoming lectures, uh, but there are some hemoglobins that only exist within the fetus. So in this stage, hemoglobin Gower 1, hemoglobin Gower 2, and hemoglobin Portland are produced. So you don't need to know the inner workings of these hemoglobins, just know that they are produced in this stage. We'll talk again, we'll talk more about hemoglobins in upcoming lectures. The second stage of fetal blood cell development is called the hepatic phase. So hematopoiesis, again, it begins in the yolk sac, and like I've said, it then trans it transitions into the liver, correct? So the hepatic phase is the phase of hematopoiesis that is in the liver. Uh, this begins around four to five weeks after fertilization. So the hematopoiesis in the yolk sac begins to decline, and the liver takes over at this point, with it reaching its peak at like about, around three months of gestation. So three months after fertilization. In this stage, there are a couple things that happen. Recognizable clusters of certain cells begin to develop, including erythroblasts, granulocytes, and monocytes. We'll talk more about these cell types throughout this uh, course, uh, but in short, erythroblasts are the first precursor to erythrocytes. Uh, so let's think of them as uh, baby red blood cells, because we know erythrocytes are red blood cells. So erythroblasts are like baby red blood cells. Granulocytes refer to white blood cells that have secretory granules in their cytoplasm. So think about these. So we've discussed five different white blood cells, neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils, right? So think about which of those five granules, uh, which of those five have granules in their cytoplasm. So neutrophils do, right? Eosinophils do, and basophils do. So do monocytes and lymphocytes, do they normally have granules? They do not, so they're not considered granulocytes, just neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. So these are what we refer to as granulocytes. Um, so monocytes are not granulocytes, uh, meaning they don't have granules uh, within their cytoplasm, but they are also present during this stage. Lymphoid cells also start to appear during this stage. So um, these are, uh, these lymphoid cells, lymphoblasts, um, are the precursors for lymphocytes. The last phase of fetal blood cell development is called the medullary phase. So around five months after fertilization, hematopoiesis shifts from the liver to the bone marrow. 
The medulla is the inner part of the bone marrow, hence the name medullary phase. The myeloid cells are the first cells to start developing here. And the myeloid cell line matures into mature adult blood cells and will take on a specific role as either a basophil, eosinophil, erythrocyte, monocyte, neutrophil, or platelet. So basically everything except a, a lymphocyte. So let's recap here. 19 days after fertilization, hematopoiesis starts in the yolk sac. Then about four to five weeks after fertilization, it transitions to the liver temporarily before finally establishing definitive hematopoiesis in the bone marrow and thymus at around five months. Then by six months after fertilization, the bone marrow becomes the primary site of hematopoiesis and remains that way. There are other hematopoietic tissues in adults other than the bone marrow. So these are other sites that can perform hematopoiesis. However, the main site is the bone marrow. So these other hematopoietic tissues are the lymph nodes, the spleen, the liver, and the thymus. The bone marrow contains the developing erythroid cells, uh, which become erythrocytes or red blood cells, developing myeloid cells, which is basically everything but lymphocytes, uh, megakaryocytic cells, uh, which become platelets, and then of course developing lymphoid cells, which become lymphocytes. So all of these cells are created uh, within the bone marrow, and they're being constantly created to replenish the cells that are dying in the peripheral bloodstream at the end of their lifespan. So let's talk about the bone marrow a little bit here. So the bone marrow is defined as the tissue located within the cavities of cortical bones, which consist of trabecular bone. So this kind of represents or re resembles a honeycomb with spaces uh, within the bones uh, for cells to grow. So bone marrow is one of the largest organs within the body and consists of two different types, red marrow and yellow marrow. The red marrow is considered hematopoietically active. So this means that it is actively producing blood cells. In an adult patient, the red marrow is found in long bones, bones of the pelvis, the sternum, the skull, the scapula, the vertebrae, and also in the ribs. The yellow marrow is considered hematopoietically inactive, meaning it is not actively producing blood cells. It's mainly composed of adipocytes, which are fat cells. In response to an increased demand for blood cells due to something like blood loss, the yellow marrow can revert back to active red marrow to start producing more blood cells. Infants and children uh, less than five years of age primarily have red hematopoietically active marrow. When the child is between five and seven years, adipose or fat becomes more plentiful and begins to occupy spaces in the long bones. Um, so it kind of replaces that red active marrow. And this is called retrogression. The body is very focused on self-preservation and homeostasis. So in certain situations, like when a patient has experienced blood loss or leukemia, which is a blood cancer, um, also if the patient is anemic, and anemia is where um, there are not enough healthy red blood cells to supply the body's tissue with oxygen. So in situations like these, uh, the body is aware that there are not enough blood cells to maintain itself. So the marrow kicks into gear and the red marrow starts to begin to replace the yellow marrow. And recall that red marrow is hematopoietically active, meaning it's able to create new blood cells. So when the body has an increased demand or an increased need for more blood cells, the marrow becomes hyperplastic, meaning uh, providing a means to supply more blood cells when needed. And how much red marrow replaces yellow marrow is related to the severity and duration of the pathological state that is causing this increased need uh, for blood cells. On the last slide, we talk about hyperplastic bone marrow, where the red hematopoietically active marrow starts to replace the yellow marrow to account for blood cell loss. Hypoplasia is where the adipocytes or the yellow marrow increase. Recall that yellow marrow is hematopoietically inactive, meaning it does not produce blood cells. So this is a suppression of blood cell development within the marrow. So there are a couple of different causes for this. It, it could be caused by an environmental factor, such as an exposure to certain toxins like pesticides. Um, bone marrow hypoplasia can also be caused genetically. 
An example of this could be um, myeloproliferative disease. So these are disorders that are characterized by cellular proliferation in the bone marrow, and then it becomes hypoplastic. So what kinds of cells are present within the bone marrow? So we have things called erythroblastic islands. So these are macrophages that are surrounded by developing erythroid cells. So if you've not watched other videos in the hematology lecture series of mine, the term erythroid means those cells that become erythrocytes, which is a fancy term for red blood cells. The macrophage portion of this erythroblastic island uh, stores iron to help nurse those developing red blood cells around it. During the erythroid uh, cell maturation, the erythroblastic island migrates to the sinuses uh, within the marrow, making it easier for mature erythrocytes to be released into the peripheral bloodstream. Granulocytes, which we've talked about already in this lecture, are white blood cells that have uh, small granules within them that release enzymes during an attack like an infection or allergic reaction. They develop from myeloblasts within the bone marrow and can either be neutrophils, eosinophils, or basophils. Granulocytes are clustered near arterioles in the bone marrow, making uh, for an easy release into the peripheral bloodstream. Lymphocytes are another type of white blood cell, but these are derived from lymphoblasts. Lymphocytes can either mature in the bone marrow and then be released. Uh, these specific lymphocytes are called B lymphocytes. Or the precursor cells can travel from the, the bone marrow into the thymus gland where they mature until they release for use. These are called T lymphocytes. For specific information on granulocytes and lymphocyte cells, uh, please check out my leukocyte lecture. And lastly, megakaryocytes are the cells that are responsible for the production of thrombocytes, which are also called platelets. The megakaryocytes hang out near the blood vessels for easy release of platelets into the peripheral bloodstream. And uh, platelets are part of the process of blood clotting uh, when an injury occurs. So for more information on platelets and the coagulation process, please check out uh, my lecture video on hemostasis. Now that we've talked about the different types of hematopoietic cells in the marrow, let's talk about the different types of hematopoietic organs. So on a previous slide, we'd already named the types of adult hematopoietic tissue, the bone marrow, the lymph nodes, the spleen, liver, and the thymus. We've already discussed the bone marrow, so let's move on uh, to these other hematopoietic organs. So the liver is the largest solid organ in the body located on the right-hand side of the abdomen. Beginning around the second trimester of pregnancy, the liver plays a significant role in hematopoiesis of the developing fetus. Recall that the second stage of fetal blood cell development is called the hepatic phase. So anytime you hear hepatic, you want to associate it with the liver. So again, hematopoiesis begins in the yolk sac, then it transitions into the liver. This begins around four to five weeks after fertilization. So the uh, hematopoiesis is in the yolk sac, and it begins to decline, and the liver takes over at this point, with it reaching its peak at about three months gestation. And at around about five months after fertilization, hematopoiesis shifts from the liver to the bone marrow, and then it remains in the bone marrow as, a, as an adult. So when hematopoiesis is occurring within the bone marrow, it can be referred to as medullary hematopoiesis because the inner part of the bone marrow is called the medulla. Now, if the bone marrow is no longer functional, these other hematopoietic organs like the liver can help to produce blood cells. So this process is called extra medullary hematopoiesis. So this term refers to blood cell production in hematopoietic tissue other than the bone marrow. So this is in the liver, the spleen, and the lymph nodes. Uh, the next hematopoietic organ we are going to discuss is the thymus. The thymus is a small gland in the lymphatic system that is located in the upper part of the anterior mediastinum. You can see on the right-hand side of this slide here, the, uh, on this little picture, the location of where the thymus is located in the body. So we have the thyroid, the two lungs, and of course there's the thymus there. So this uh, lymph, uh, lymphopoietic organ is responsible for storing the T lymphocytes while they mature. And recall the T lymphocytes are a critical part of the immune system of the body. Uh, for more detailed information on lymphocytes, uh, please check out my leukocyte lecture. The spleen is another hematopoietic organ. It serves as a filter and is located in the upper left abdominal quadrant to the left of the stomach under the ribs. 
The spleen has three zones of tissues, uh, the white pulp, the red pulp, and something called the marginal zone. The white pulp is composed of lymphoid tissue and contains lymphocytes. The red pulp is composed of a network of sinusoids and splenic cords that are filled with blood. These sinuses provide spaces for venous blood and the splenic cords are composed of masses of reticular tissue and macrophages or macrophages that lay between these sinuses. Uh, the red pulp is where the most of the, like the filtration of the spleen occurs. Now the marginal zone is a reticular mesh that has vessels, uh, macrophages, and lymphocytes and is located at the junction of the white pulp and the red pulp. Let's talk about the function of the spleen. It's a pretty important organ. Uh, two main things that it accomplishes are something we call culling and pitting. A culling is the process of the spleen removing red blood cells from the circulation when they are either damaged, abnormal, or at the end of their lifespan. Pitting refers to when the spleen removes or picks out particles from intact red blood cells without destroying those red blood cells. It will perform pitting with remnants of DNA present in the red blood cells, so we refer to these remnants as how jolly bodies when we see them on a peripheral blood smear. It will also perform pitting with remnants of mitochondrial iron present in the red blood cells. So we refer to these inclusions as Pappenheimer bodies when seen on a peripheral blood smear. So for more information on how jolly bodies and Pappenheimer bodies and also other red blood cells inclusions that uh, we need to know as clinical laboratory professionals, uh, please refer to my lecture on red blood cell morphology. So macrophages or macrophages are present to remove any antigen or antibody, antigen antibody complexes and attached membranes. We've already discussed the white pulp, marginal zone, and the red pulp. So the, the white pulp is rich with lymphocytes, which are an integral part of the immune system. The red pulp acts as a filter, destroys red blood cells, and sequesters platelets. Lymph nodes are bean-shaped structures that are located in various areas of the body, including the neck, the armpits, chest, abdomen, and groin. They are responsible for filtering substances that travel through the lymphatic system and contain lymphocytes to help fight infection. Each lymph node contains an outer cortex and an inner medulla. The cortex contains inactive B cell follicles, which are surrounded by T lymphocytes and macrophages. The medulla is the innermost layer of the lymph node consisting of cords of plasma cells. Plasma cells secrete antibodies, which are important in the body's immune system. The germinal center of the lymph node helps to produce antibody secreting plasma cells and B cells, which provide the body with protection against reinfection. This drawing shows the structure of the lymph node. You can see the cortex here with follicles and germinal centers and also the medulla of the lymph node. So this, uh, this concludes um, the lecture video on the structure and function of hematopoietic organs. Please check out my other videos. And if you like this video, uh, please make sure to like it and also subscribe to my channel. And please feel free to write a comment in the comment section if you have any questions um, or any suggestions on uh, future presentations.